It's kind of hard to be discouraged when you're around a bunch of thankful people. I've come up here, I haven't even started my message yet, and I've already been exhorted two times. I saw behind me clarifying the nature and content of the gospel, and so that kind of helps keep us on track. But I also saw out in front of me a sound booth that says, Preach Christ. So if the preacher's kind of getting off track because of infirmity, all he has to do is look at the sound booth, and he's getting an exhortation from the sound booth to preach Christ. That is who I want to preach this morning, Romans chapter 1, verse 4, that Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power, with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. An adjoining text in 1 John chapter 4, and verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. There is no one who is like the living God. God said of himself, I am God and there is none else. The psalmist had this to say about God. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. When it comes to power, Jeremiah had this to say, For inasmuch as there is none like unto thee, Lord, thou art great and thy name is great in might. When it comes to the wisdom of God, Jeremiah also affirmed, Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. When it comes to the righteousness of God, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Jesus is the Son of God. That means the same thing that is true of God is true of the Son of God. We can rightly say this, there is nobody who is like the Son of God. Whenever Jesus calmed that raging sea, his disciples who were completely afraid by this raging storm. Jesus stood up and the scripture says that he rebuked the sea. And it records this about that occasion. They feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Interpretation. There is no man that is like him. Any of you ever tried to rebuke a wave? I've never tried it. I don't think it would obey me. The gospel is the record that God has given of his son. And from what I have said, this is what that means. It is a declaration of the things that are unique to Christ. Nobody is like Jesus and nobody does what Jesus does. And if a gospel is being proclaimed that any man can do, it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It isn't. The article, the, which is so often, so often appended to the titles of Jesus, tells us of the uniqueness of the Son of God. He is the Son of God. For example, John said this about him, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God looked. And there was none to help, and there was no one to make intercession. No one else has been able to take away sin, but the Lamb of God has done it. He is also the living bread. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Anybody else out there offering eternal life? He's the living bread. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Can any man do that? You see, Jesus is unique. And the gospel is a declaration of the uniqueness of the Son of God. Because Jesus is unique... Jesus is indispensable in the work of salvation. 
I mean, I know you realize, like I do, how many substitutes that are being presented to people that are walking by faith, claiming to do the very things that the scripture says that only Jesus can do, the three-step plan of church growth, the five-step plan of how to get out of sin and stay out, these kind of things that are out there. Nobody can do what Jesus can do. And that's part of him being the son of God, brethren. There is nobody that is like him. Now, the scripture says here that he is declared to be the son of God. For example, at his birth. Think of the marvelous and wonderful things that were surrounding these marvelous declarations of him being the son of God. Here at his birth, you may recall some of the marvelous things. For example, angels announced his birth to the shepherds. Did angels announce the birth of any of your children? You may recall that Jesus had his own star, and that was the mean by which the Magi came from the east, and they presented all manner of precious and royal gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, things that Joseph and Mary could never have bought for themselves. God's leaving a testimony that there's nobody like his son. That's what he's doing. And in the midst of the angelic activity, we have this word from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6. When he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. At his birth, angels worshiped him. Now I'll tell you right now, no angel has worshiped any man. But they did worship the Son of God. Amen. See, he is the Son of God. At his baptism, you may recall some of the wonderful things that happened there. The scripture says that while Jesus was praying, the heavens opened. Ever had that happen? Jesus had it happen. The heavens were opened. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove, something that could be visibly seen. At the same time, God gave an audible testimony of his Son, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. See, he is declared to be the son of God. At his transfiguration there in Matthew chapter 17, again, the scripture says that while he was praying, the countenance of his face was altered and his face did shine as the sun. At the same time, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah talking with him about his death. Have any of you talked to Moses and Elijah about your involvement in the work of God? Jesus did. He did. At the same time, Peter makes this inquiry because he is awoken to see these things and how to handle these marvelous and miraculous things that are taking place. And he says, now let us make a tabernacle. That is, we want this thing to continue on. You can't blame Peter for that part of it. We'd want it to continue on too. But you don't put the Son of God on the same level with any man. I don't care how godly they are. And so God spoke out of heaven, this is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. You see, he is declared to be the Son of God. At his death, there were marvelous things that were taking place at the death of Jesus Christ. For example, the death of Christ itself was a miracle. Jesus laid down his life. That's not true of any other man. For all other men, they do not have power, just like Song of Solomon said. No man has power in the day of his death. But Jesus did. In fact, he had received a commandment to lay his life down and take it up again. Jesus was in control of all the events that surrounded his death. I know that you know this, but it's good to say this. Jesus did not die of natural causes. He didn't die because the Jews were subtle and because the Romans were powerful. He had absolute control over his death, and he gave up his own spirit to God. At that very same time, you may recall some miraculous things that took place. The scripture says that the earth did quake. It didn't say Jerusalem had an earthquake. It said the earth did quake. I get the idea that this is a global quaking that was taking place. At the same time, the scripture says the rocks were rent and the graves were open. You may recall after his resurrection, 
some of these people that had been dead, saints of old, came out and came into the city as a testimony. Now, I don't think that's happened in anyone else's death, but it did happen at his death. And it was upon seeing these events that that centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. He's declared to be the Son of God. He is uniquely the Son of God. So what do I mean by that? I mean this. This whole renewal theme, what we've been talking about, the whole renewal is about the work and attributes of God. So how does Jesus being the Son of God relate to all that? You know, the entire purpose of salvation is for God to be glorified in those in whom his, in, in whom his image is. They that bear his image. That's the whole purpose of salvation. Throughout scriptural history, you see godly people reflecting some aspect of God. And some, there are like preeminent things that they showed about God. For example, Adam. He was a depiction of the fatherhood of God, for all life sprung forth from him. And all life comes forth from God. Noah was like a picture of the faithfulness of God. For 120 years, Noah had this project. But he was faithful. Abraham was like a picture of the sacrificial love of God. When God came to him and said, Take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him on a mountain I'll show you. It's like a picture. See, when we look back at that, it's like, it's like a picture that, that shows forth what, what the father himself did through his son. David is like a picture of the tenderness of our God, and you can see that in his psalms and these things. Solomon is like a depiction of the riches of our God, exceeding riches. Moses is like a depiction of the law of God, unyielding. You remember Phineas? Aaron's grandson who ran in following the man of God into his own tent when he had taken a foreign woman and ran them both through with a javelin. He's like a depiction of the indignation of God. Is God safe? Only in Christ. Only in Christ, brethren. Samson is like a depiction of the strength of God, things that he did. Peter is like a depiction of the zeal of our God got that zeal. And Paul is a de marvelous depiction of the grace of God and the wisdom of God. Look at how much poured out of Paul with regards to the kingdom of God. And if we went around this room, we could actually do this. We could actually talk about different things that are being beheld in the life of God's people, because that's what salvation is all about. But when we say that Jesus is the son of God, here's what we mean. Every attribute of God is beheld in him. Everyone. There's not one attribute we've talked about during this time or will talk about that is not exemplified in the Son of God. Amen. He is the image of God and the exact representation of his being. That's what we mean by that. In fact, you may recall that when Jesus was talking there in John chapter 14 and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And then he talks about, and he, he tells his disciples, he says, and you have seen him, and you have known him. And you remember what Philip said? He said, show us the Father, and it will suffice. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long, and have you not known the Father? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now, none of you can say that in the same way Jesus can say it. There are aspects of God being beheld in us, but it's not complete. But when you look into the life of Jesus, you see a complete representation of the person of God. I'll tell you, that, that is a marvelous thing to see. Okay, The scripture says it this way. For God, who commanded light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a truth this is. John himself said, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only, only, only 
begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you wanted to know, is God a working God, then just look at Jesus at 12 years of age going into the temple and saying, I must be about my father's business. Go. I'll tell you, if you're not interested in working, heaven's not going to be a place that you're going to want to be. You know? And I know you're not there, but there are a lot of people that profess faith that are like in that category. Had they not beheld the nature of God in the person of Jesus, Jesus says, I work and my father works. You see that in him. Can God keep us from falling? Look at Jesus come to the end of his life, having kept his disciples, and he said, all that you have given me, I have kept, and there is none that is lost. Can he keep you from falling? Look at what he did for his disciples. Is God a merciful God? Is he merciful toward unrighteousness? Look at this adulterous woman that was cast at the feet of Jesus. She was caught in the act of adultery, by the way. Some people wouldn't have given her another chance. Some people would have just cast her out right there, but that is not what the Son of God did, is it? When they sought to condemn her, remember what he said? Well, okay, anybody that's around that doesn't have sin, you can start the casting. And by defending this woman, he did not defend her sin. But he did not let her be condemned. Where are those thine accusers? And she said, none, Lord. That ought to tell you right there. Somewhat of her attitude in standing before this holy Jesus. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. And he said that to every one of you too. You see that in the person of Jesus Christ. Can the God of peace speak peace? Well, I'll tell you, if he can calm a storm by a word, he can speak peace to your heart, and he's done it to every one of us. Is God the God of all comfort? Look at Jesus when he faces that paralytic man and says, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Why is Jesus that way? Because he's the Son of God. That's how God is. And so that's how Jesus is. Is God infinite in wisdom? Look at the knowledge that was pouring out of Jesus to such a degree that the Jews durst not ask him any more questions. You see, there is no attribute of God that is not clearly seen in the Son of God. If you want to see God clearly, you've got to look into the face of Jesus Christ. Because that's what it means, brethren, for him to be the Son of God. No wonder God said of him, thy throne, O God, is forever. That, that's, that's a wonderful declaration. But now he's declared to be the Son of God with power. Whenever John spoke about the objective of his writing of the Gospel of John, here's what he had to say about this. He said, these are written, these various accounts, are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And I always wondered, what is he talking about the these? These are written. Talking about all those wonderful attesting miracles that we see that are written throughout the Gospels. Does Jesus really have power? Does he have power? Well, you've got to think to yourselves, have you ever paid your taxes through the mouth of a fish? Yeah. Now, I understand that this is a lower display of power, and I'm going to get to the higher in just a second, but God left a witness through miracles. I'm not a miracle monger, but I want to take advantage of a power that is being displayed in Jesus that cannot be wielded by any man on earth. We go to the bank to get money. Jesus can get it from a fishing hole. Amen. Jesus can rebuke a troubled sea with a word. I like that. It says he rebuked the sea. He rebuked it with a word, and it obeyed. That's amazing. Jesus can feed a multitude by the lunch of a young boy. He can do that. Fed that multitude. He can do that. He can end a funeral by raising the dead. It just stops immediately. I think there must have been a measure of confusion because you have to go from sorrow to immediate joy. But there in Nain, he handed that young man back to his mother, and she was, I'll tell you, in the words of Luke, she was not a little comforted, I'm sure. She was not. Jesus can take life from a fig tree with a word. 
That's serious. That's serious. You suppose some people's lives has been taken because Jesus said something? Possibly. He can do that. Remember when he told his disciples, have faith in God. Well, that, I'll tell you, if you saw that, brethren, you'd say, what manner of man is this? See, brethren, all these things, and we could rehearse many more, but these things were like put in place by God to attest to Jesus being the Son of God, to like elevate, elevate the desires of men, to get their desires out of this world. I'm sorry, but you do not come away from the feeding of the 5,000 and say, you know, I think Jesus can multiply bread for us all the time. I think he could be a good bread maker for us. But isn't that what they did? That's how unbelief talks. But I'm sorry, you don't come away from the resurrection of Lazarus and say, you know what? I think Jesus can give me a bigger bank account. When you're a man that walks by faith, you come away from the resurrection and say, you alone have the words of eternal life. There's nobody like Jesus. Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power. And more than these things that I have said, can Jesus do? You know, working salvation is no less difficult than doing all those things I just said. It's all impossible. And so God like stuck under the noses of men things that no man can do in order to tell us what salvation is all about. No man can do it. Who among us can put away all sin by one act of obedience? Which, by the way, just so you know how much glory was in the redemption that is in Christ, the entire Levitical system is a portrayal of what Jesus did in like four hours. Redemption, when he laid his life down. That's amazing. Jesus can satisfy the indignation of God and give God a just basis for justifying the ungodly. Thank you, Brother Tim, for that word. That's hard. It's hard. Jesus, God had a greater need than humanity ever had. It's not easy to satisfy God. But Jesus did it. Jesus can make men reign in the same place they were once slaves to sin. I'll tell you, this is, getting, this is giving a lot of glory to God. Because I'm telling you about things that no man can do. No man can do that. Only they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Jesus can do this. There is hope, brethren, for a weaker brother. For Jesus can make that brother stand. He can do it. He's able. He can make a child of disobedience become a follower of God and even be a dear child. He can turn a defeated race into a conquering army. He can do it. He can make a beggar on a dunghill to inherit the throne of glory. Isn't that what he's doing? See, God's doing what no man can do. And he's doing it through the Son of God. The Son of God with power. I love to think about that. But now he's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. So this is another important thing to see about the Son of God is that he's holy, is that he's righteous. In fact, before coming into the world, the prophets spoke about his holiness. In Jeremiah 23, 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Before ever coming into the world, this testimony was going out. The one who is coming to deliver the world is righteous. He's righteous. At his birth, the angels spake and told Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I'm afraid that men have been guilty by referring to this title of Jesus as the Son of Man as to bring him down a little bit too low. Jesus was not tempted in the same way that we were tempted. For one, Jesus didn't have a sinful nature. Yeah. Oh, that's so important to see that. No, he can't identify with sin. He cannot. Was he tempted? Yes, but it was not. It was generally on the same level, but not specifically. Hmm? That which is in thee is of the Holy Ghost. See, all of us have to say, like David, I was conceived in sin in my mother's womb, but Jesus was not. 
He was not. He was holy. And his temptation, the righteousness and holiness of Christ was lived out when he said, no, no, no. I like what John said. He said, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. Part of doing righteousness is refusing evil. Amen. Jesus always refused evil. Jesus never had to confess sin. Jesus never had to apologize. Jesus never had to repent for sin of any kind. Jesus never fell short of the glory of God like we fall short. He never did. Never. Never misrepresenting the glory and person of God. Never. Everything he did was absolutely perfect. Amen. Absolutely holy. In the entirety of his time on earth is summed up in the apostolic doctrine. He did no sin. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps who did no sin. Paul said this, he knew no sin. See, he was, he was holy, okay? Now let me bring these things together with this last thing because this is so important. He says here that he is declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So see, these things have been declared in scriptures, but they are also demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about this. He's declared to be the Son of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. It's a depiction of his resurrection. God brought him back. See, why is that so significant? You know, it's interesting... We know that Jesus said that he raised himself from the dead, right? He had a commandment to lay down his life and take it up again. And, but we also know it's true that the Father raised him from the dead. But when the apostles rehearsed and preached in the book of Acts about this, they didn't say Jesus raised himself from the dead. They said God raised him from the dead. Over and over, this word is mentioned. Acts chapter 3, verse 15, and he killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. Acts chapter 5, verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Acts chapter 13 and verse 23, of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Why? Why is that so consistent? You know, in his death, it looked as if Jesus was being smitten for his own iniquities. In fact, the Jews actually called out and said, let God receive him. If he, if he be, if he be the son of God, that is how it looked. But you see, the resurrection of Christ confirms the seal of God upon who Jesus is and upon everything that he did. It's the seal. It's the seal of acceptance. And it is the reason why we can be received. It's the reason why we can be received. For example, Jesus, Jesus he said this. He says, labor not for the meat that perishes, but for the meat that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. Amen. See? You see, we are accepted, brethren, because the Son was accepted. And when he raised his son from the dead, it was the seal that God had received everything that he would done. Everything. And everything that he is. The scripture says that we are accepted in the beloved. It is also a demonstration of his righteousness. He was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Jesus didn't have any sin of his own. You know, that's why I love, when you look back at the Levitical system, you see things about the realities concerning Christ that are so marvelous. For example, on the Day of Atonement, there, were, there was the presentation of two goats before the tent where God was, and a lot was cast. One was cast for the, to be the sin offering, which that one was slain and the blood was offered, and the other was to be the scapegoat. And you remember, they put their hands on the goat and confessed all the sins of the people, and then, you remember what happened then? Then they had to get themselves a fit man. 
to take that goat out far enough to where that goat can never wander again back into the company of the people of God. I'll tell you, that's, that's, there's a meditation right there. Why did he have to be a fit man? Because he couldn't just go out, he had to come back. Now that's a marvelous thing to see. The death of Christ was not the end of the work of God. It was the finishing of what God was doing in the earth, but there was still a work to be done, and the Son of God still was going to be the one to do it. How did he come back? Wasn't he cursed by God? Weren't all the sins of the world laid upon him and he was cursed by God? How did he come back after being smitten? Because he was a fit man. So what was his fitness? His righteousness. That was his fitness. Jesus did not bear any sin of his own, just like Isaiah 53 says. He was smitten for our iniquities. And so he came back. And so according to the spirit of holiness, he was raised from the dead. Why is that so important? Because he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. You see, the confirmation of the righteousness of Christ is the guarantee that Jesus being the administrator over the work of God, it was sure to continue to be a righteous work in all of it. A completely righteous work. I think that's a marvelous thing to be seen. But we also see, and this is the last thing I have to, have to say for you tonight, to, to you this afternoon, is that it was a demonstration of his great power. You actually see in the resurrection of Christ what Christ was going to do in us. Amen. So can a man really come back from being in sin and being dead? Well, go and look at the Savior where he was in his death. All the sin of the world was laid upon him, and he died, but he was brought back from the dead. See, that, that, that's like hope for all of us. It's like a demonstration of the kind of power that he gives, that he extends to all who believe. And I think that, that is a marvelous thing to see. Now, there's one last thing, and I just want to tie this into 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, or uh, actually that other text. Let me read that for you again real quick. He says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 15, he says, Whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. Now here is something interesting. If the resurrection is so central to what God is doing in salvation, isn't it an astounding thing that nobody saw him raised from the dead? Not a soul. No one saw him. No one saw it happen. Why? Because you're going to be saved by grace through faith. Hmm? You're going to believe the record God gave of his son. Amen. Now, that, that's just what I've sought to do today. That's just what I've sought to do. We have this commandment from God. This is his commandment that we believe on the name of his son. So what is his name? This is his name. He is uniquely the son of God because all the attributes of God are in him. He is the son of God, and that is a pillar of our faith. And he is the son of God with power. That is to say, all power in heaven and earth has been given to him. You know, a man that's convinced of that doesn't seek for other kind of powers. He trusts in Christ because he has all the power. The power to raise from the dead, the power to quicken, the power to prepare you to stand before the presence of God. Amen. And this pillar of his righteousness and his holiness. His offering was received because he is righteous. And everything that he continues to do is received because he's righteous. He's righteous. And so, brother, these, these, these and a number of other things are what we believe. You know, I've sought to bring that thing out. But faith is so central in our reception of God. Who does God dwell in? He dwells in the one who believes the record that God has given of his son. Thank you, brother.